Good morning. Thanks for tuning in. This is Kathy for Getting Chatty with Kathy. And today I have a very special guest. Um, it takes me back to my formative years, maybe some years that I try and not look at pictures of because they are definitely in the late 90s hair. Um, I have my biology teacher from Luther High School, Mr. Brooks. Hi, Mr. Brooks. Hello, it's good to be here. It's good to have you. So Mr. Brooks taught me grade 10 biology. I remember it very well as sitting in the classroom and we dissected frogs. And you taught us the most captivating class, like the whole hour we were in there learning and listening to a very good teacher. You were a teacher that stayed with me and I'm in my 40s now. There's no doubt that it's my favorite subject, but, <laughs> but I, I found that most kids found find biology or found back back then biology to be inherently interesting subject because it's a lot of it is hands-on definitely um, and a lot of the stuff with biology can be practical I, I like earlier we were just discussing before we started uh, recording about geraniums um, mr. Brooks is also I should say one of my neighbors we live very close to each other and when I moved into the neighborhood I quickly saw that he has an immaculate yard that him and his wife take care of, and they like geraniums. Yeah, geraniums. <laughs> and I just um, heard you tell me about how geraniums were grown at Luther. So how about let's just quickly go into biology and how it was like being a biology teacher and what, what that was like. Absolutely, and in talking about how biology can be a practical activity um, and practical learning, uh, what we would do is, uh, uh, what I'd have our students do is get engaged in growing uh, geraniums uh, in the early spring right from little seedlings and so that they had a, a half a dozen or so each that they were responsible for in the school's greenhouse and so that they would nurture them until they were blooming and they were ready uh, in the month of May or early June, depending on the weather, to be transplanted into the gardens around Luther College High School, including the circle in the front, which is, uh, was my favorite place to place red geraniums. And so then we would have classes where we'd go outdoors, kids with their flowers, and then we would plant them, do mass plantings of red geraniums. And uh, over the summer, they just bloomed and looked beautiful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And your house, it's a continued thing. It's stunning. I've got the time now in retirement to do that kind of thing. So my wife and I, Sharon and I, um, Spend a lot of time in the yard. Just came from my yard uh, it, uh, before I came to this interview. Perfect place to be. As it, I, I know that you guys are listening, so you can um, be there, but envision a pergola just filled with green and beautiful, beautiful, happy flowers all over the place. And it just seems like a really peaceful place to hang out. Mm -hmm. Flower garden and vegetable garden as well. And uh, Sharon focuses on flowers and I focus on the vegetables ah. but we help each other how is your veggies this year uh, going very well this is uh, the earliest uh, uh, crop of vegetables that we've had in a long time it's been pretty good we yeah. got tomatoes the size of like baseballs already yes red. absolutely I've had a couple dozen uh, tomatoes and have been passing them out to, to friends and family and, and folks because they all seem to ripen almost at the same time it's the best thing from the garden yeah so practical learning at Luther for biology, but I'm sure that there was more to it at Luther. Luther, I, I honestly think we're a community of our own and um, we want to take care of each other. You know, funny, I was at the Royal Museum and I ran into Craig Perot, another Luther alumni, yes. and he was just so helpful. And I think that there's something about that, that we just, uh, we're, we're a team. I agree that the Luther College community is a family, a multi-generational family. And as I got older as a teacher, um, I started to teach students who were kids of former, <laughs> former yes. students. Yeah. Full circle. Mm -hmm. You're Absolutely. not just influencing mom and dad's biology class, now the kids, my goodness. Yeah. It was definitely a school that changed me to be direct, direct my life to be much more positive. I fully, fully love Luther with all of my being. I definitely think that they, the teachers at Luther changed my life. When I was in grade nine, I actually went to a different high school and I didn't go to classes too much. And 
I was kind of one of those rebellious teenagers. And when I went to Luther, I could tell this meant business. I was going to get my education and it changed my life. I, I love Luther. I, I think that broadly speaking, the teachers at Luther College when I was there uh, had a common way of working with students. And that is, uh, we, we broadly would say to the kids, you know, uh, we will teach, we, we will teach you and work with you as, as equals, and uh, until your behavior tells me otherwise, then we've got to, then we've got to talk about that. And I would happily say that I virtually never had to speak with students about issues. The kids were amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And, it's just a different vibe. And now they're amazing adults, and they're out <laughs> all over the world doing amazing things. Yeah. I'm so proud to be part of that. Mm -hmm. So biology teacher was definitely a big hat. How, how many years did you teach for? At Luther College for 32 years in the same classroom, <laughs> uh, the same subject, biology, but uh, to 64 semesters of kids. And as long as you are a teacher teaching kids, that is to say, you're not teaching the subject of kids, you're teaching kids the subject. There's a different perspective. Uh, it's a really engaging and personal exercise. It is very, very, very much uh, positive for me, and I remember it. So you were doing something right. So how did you also put on the Army Reserve hat? Mm -hmm. Well, my family, uh, with my dad, uh, uh, we have a background of military service. So when we serve Canada, this is one way that we serve Canada, is the family serves uh, through the military, and I chose to serve in the reserves, um, and as my father did. And so through the cadets and into the reserves seemed to me to be a logical uh, advancement as I got older. Um, and then I, I spent 20 years uh, serving with my regiment, the Royal Regina Rifles, uh, and then 20 more years after that serving in different headquarters uh, in command and staff positions. And so 40 years of, of military service. Uh, I also met my wife through the military and she served for over 20 years. And all of my kids have been through cadets and have been through some aspect of the reserves and uh, or into the regular forces here. Very interesting. I actually remember your son Kylo um, getting involved with it over the years. And I remember you coming to school in your uniform. Mm -hmm. So for somebody who's not really familiar with like what it means to like get into cadets, could you take me back to like, um, like I'm a mom, I have two girls, one's aged seven, one aged 10. How could I get them involved? Well, kids when they turn 12, 13, 13 years old, start to become teenagers. Uh, one of the ways uh, kids can start to participate in the community would be to participate in the cadets. And they start out as followers. They learn followership, how it is to follow their leaders. And then having learned that, then they start to blossom as young leaders themselves. And I found out an awful lot of young people who've gone through the cadets become extraordinary community leaders. How is that? What is, is it because you're teaching them about community at an early age that really grounds that foundation into them? Mm -hmm. Teaching them, I think, more about uh, leadership and practical activities as a cadet, such as first aid, uh, 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 field craft, how, how to go up camping and you know, how to, mm -hmm. to, to live, winter camping, those kinds of things. Uh, um, they give kids practical skills, but they also allow them to understand that their limits that they think they have can be pushed even further back as they learn more and more about themselves and they gain in a certain self-confidence, they have a certain self-esteem and they start to blossom as young leaders. That's a wonderful thing to get a kid. Now, so you just go to say like the Legion or? Uh, no, actually there are, uh, there are army cadets, the two units that uh, serve uh, out of the armory is in Regina on Alphonstone Street. Uh, there's also uh, a, uh, a Navy cadet organization and a, and a sea cadet organization uh, for young people over at HMCS Queen, the Queen Building. Uh, and, and those are the two options that are available. Oh, no, that's not true. There's also a third option, that is the Air Cadets. There are a couple of Air Cadet squadrons in Regina as well. Uh, and they also serve, uh, I think, 
one in the armory and one at the uh, HMCS Queen, if I'm not mistaken. Is there a large fee to put your kid into? Oh, there's no fee involved. In fact, uh, the Cadets is, a, is a, a youth program, the only youth program that is funded by the federal government. Wow. And so federal funds uh, are used to support cadets. And then they also have uh, parent programs that uh, provide uh, volunteer um, fundraising programs that help with different aspects of the cadet program. That's super. So you get to give kids a good foundation and it doesn't cost the family a large amount. That's true. Is it one, once a week that you would get together and then do camps on weekends? Usually, usually cadets go uh, once a week and then they have uh, weekend activities where they have specific things in mind, field craft, uh, uh, navigation, how to use a map and a compass, for example, um, um, orienteering, those kinds of things. They're, uh, it's very good for developing personal skills, outdoor activities, become an act outdoor active person uh, to grow physically, but to also grow in terms of your ability to lead. There's something to biology in that, I feel like, too. Well, it's interesting you should say that because some people might say, how does being in the Army Reserve allow you to be a better biology teacher? And I, and I know that it did, and it has to do with the fact that my, my outdoor-ness, if I can call it that, my interest and ability to work out of doors allowed me to be able to take, uh, oh, almost 30 years of activity, field trip activities with my grade 11 and grade 12 biology students um, uh, on field trip, camping activities, uh, biology uh, oriented activities out of doors all seasons, uh, in winter included, winter camping, but also uh, further afield to the Badlands, uh, up north to uh, Churchill River, but international activities including my opportunity to take students to the Galapagos Islands. Shush. Yes. Could you dive into that a little awesome. bit for us? Yeah. It was a Easter 10 day field trip, biology field trip that I planned back in grade nine with a group of kids and we carried it through to grade 12 and at the end of grade 12 or Easter grade 12, uh, we all decided that it would be a good idea to carry on with them and we went, we went and did it. We went to That's Galapagos incredible. and it was amazing. So to get to the Galapagos, if I understand correctly, you even need to apply to like get on you into do. the park. You do, and then and then you fly to Quito, Ecuador first, and then from there you fly from Quito, Ecuador into onto the, the islands themselves. So as a biology teacher with your Darwin like hat on you, how was that for Following you? Following in the footsteps of Charles, ah. Charles Darwin was amazing, absolutely amazing. Were you able to see birds? Oh, all kinds, all kinds, including Darwin's finches. Yeah. Really? Absolutely. What an incredible experience. So you took four years of fundraising, I imagine, too, to get there? Or just to learn about the actual the first couple of years, grade 9 and 10, just getting the group of kids together and starting to work together toward the objective. And then in grade 11 and 12, engaging parents uh, and students together in fundraising so that uh, it wasn't a hardship for uh, for any family to be right. able to go That's on a they, cheap trip. To go. <laughs> what a great idea. You know, when I was at Luther, we saved in my class in grade 12, we went to Italy. Hmm. And that actually sparked and ignited my love for going overseas and seeing other cultures. Absolutely. I think travel broadens the mind. Uh, travel uh, allows us to understand that there are cultures and there are ways of living that are different than our own. And so it without that travel, we would think that everybody either behaves like us or should behave like us. But in fact, that's absolutely not the case. Uh, broadening the mind means that there are 101 different ways uh, to live out a life, and none of them is better than the other. It's just suitable, suitable, from, suitable for the environment in which they live. Mm -hmm. So when you were in the Galapagos as a biology teacher, Four years in the making of mm -hmm. thinking about it, doing it. What was like? What was it like? Did you guys? Th was there any highlights that stand out in your I mind? Was, I was share? just one of the kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm not sure that there was any particular highlight over any other. They were all highlights. There were just it was just extraordinary that we would 
we would be able to uh, uh, see the things that Darwin saw, um, uh, see the variety of species that existed on different islands and how it was the nature of that particular island that selected for the characteristics of the birds and other animals that over time shaped them to become subspecies and ultimately the species. Oh, I would say there was one species and it was a single turtle, a uh, hundred or some year old male who was the last of his species. And uh, uh, Lonesome George was his name. Oh. And uh, they were trying to find a subspecies or, uh, that would perhaps interest him, female, that they could mate and carry on his genes. But about 10 years after we went, I understand that Lonesome George passed away. You know, all of the areas that are protected in there, it's key to keep that going. There's so many varieties of animals that we just haven't even explored yet. Yes, yes, and, and that particular environment is very sensitive, and so therefore, as a UNESCO Universal World uh, Heritage Site, they limit the exposure to groups of people, and so you have to really, in advance, put yourself in the queue to be able to go do that. That's amazing. So biology, now I'm putting on your reserve hat, and now that you've retired, could you tell me how that role changes? Are you are you still going and meeting with everybody, or how does it work? Well, after you've been in the Army Reserve for 40 years, it's not possible to just turn, <laughs> I don't think turn it could be, switch, no. Turn the switch and switch it off, in the same way that being a teacher is becomes a part of the way you live. Um, uh, after uh, a few years of uh, stepping away, I was asked to come back to the regiment uh, in retirement to become one of their honorary colonels. And uh, so I did that for nine years after that. And the re responsibility of the honorary colonel really is to connect the young soldiers, the current generation of members of my regiment, the Royal Regina Rifles, with the generations of past members of the Regina Rifles. And to, to get them to appreciate that the regiment is not what you see today on the army floor, they are the custodians of our regimental history. And that one of my job is, is to knit the past into the present and then to anticipate what the regiment will be and look like in the future. So it, on a continuum is to have a broader view of the of the unit, but more than that, of a broader view of the unit as it relates to the community of Regina. Because quite literally, tens of thousands of young people over a hundred years have been through the Royal Regina Rifles and have gone on to do amazing things. Unfortunately, some of them did not return home. Uh, the number 458 looms large in our regimental history. Um, uh, well over a thousand landed on D-Day, the 6th of June, 1944. Um, uh, and they went on to fight through France, uh, to Belgium, uh, to Holland, the Netherlands, and then into Germany, uh, over 11 months uh, to end the war. Uh, when the war was over, um, nearly a thousand were injured, some of them physically, some of them uh, carrying mental scars, uh, but 458 did not return home to their families. And so next year, the 80th anniversary of D-Day, uh, my responsibility is to help uh, the regiment send a contingent of young members to walk in the footsteps of the 458, to walk in the footsteps of their uh, former Regina Riflemen, their heroes, uh, to make it real for them, to help them with that continuity of knowledge and understanding of the regiment from the past through the present and on into the future. Uh, we're also going to be uh, placing and, uh, and, and unveiling a statue of a Regina Rifleman, an eight foot bronze statue, uh, a not inexpensive exercise, I might say, uh, and we're hoping to be able to get Princess Anne, who is our colonel in chief, to attend in order to do the unveiling. What a powerful thing. And 
those um, people that are going with you, are, those are some big shoes to fill while they're mm -hmm. I'm hoping that we can have some of the grandchildren of some of the Second World War veterans come along with us as well. This um, is airing just before Remembrance Day, mm -hmm. so I really appreciate us taking a moment to really think about the past and where we plan to be in the future. Absolutely. I would also like to say, if I may, that there are lots of people in the community of Regina who know folks who are members of their families who are in the Regina Rifles. If it's important to them and they would like to contribute in some small way, it's possible for them to make a donation uh, to the Royal Regina Rifles Trust Fund. You can do so through an organization known as Canada Helps. If you go to canadahelps.org and then you look up the Royal Regina Rifles Trust Fund, there you will be able to make a donation to the regiment and help us to be able to have those young people walk in the footsteps of their heroes uh, and also for us to be able to pay for <laughs> the bronze statue of a Regina Rifleman, a larger than life statue of uh, depicting a rifleman coming off the beach uh, into and onto the uh, fields of France. You know, Canadians, when we travel, those footsteps make our travels easier. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was in France, people opened up their houses to us Absolutely. because of that. Mm -hmm. And they referenced, referenced it, and it was 50, 60 years ago. Mm -hmm. How do you look at what we're doing now with our reserves, and what is it like that, like now? Well, in the same way that I encourage parents to consider having their kids join the cadets, I'm also uh, a person who, by my nature, encourages young people, uh, not necessarily in the cadets, but young people, generally speaking, if they're interested uh, from age 16 to 18, uh, might consider joining the reserves. If you're age 16 or 17, you need your parents' consent, uh, or 18 or beyond, uh, to consider joining the reserves for some period of time, like my son uh, Kylo did for six years, but my other son, uh, Keaton went from the reserves into the regular force. My, my daughter Mackenzie was with the cadets and then she uh, became a cadet instructor as a reservist as well. Um, and, and as I said, my wife was in the reserves for more than 20 years as well. And our whole family was involved. Um, and if this sounds like something that might be a wonderful opportunity for young people in Regina, um, I would encourage you to consider going down to the Regina Armory and talking with a recruiter about the possibility, at least, of uh, perhaps uh, serving in the reserves for a short period of time, or I don't know, maybe even 40 years, <laughs> who knows. And so being a reservist, what does that actually mean? Does that mean if there's a flood or a fire, we would be called? Would our employer yes. have to allow us to leave? Like, how does that work? Um, reservists and regular members sign a contract with the federal government. The difference is that regular members sign a five-year contract that commits them um, to continue to serve wherever their unit is sent for whatever mission they're sent upon. I'll do it. Uh, and that's it. Uh, that's what you do for five years and if you want to renew it you can or at the end of five years you can say thank you very much and move on. In the reserves however it's entirely different. Reserve service is voluntary. In fact, I, I would consider reserve service, you are twice the volunteer because you volunteered to be a reservist and to take the training to be a trained reservist. And then after age 18, if the reserves are required to do deployments, either as members of uh, the reserves domestically for fire or floods or overseas on op overseas operations, supporting the regular force, you need to volunteer a second time for those activities. Oh, I didn't so that. your service is uh, is voluntary in both aspects. Absolutely. So you have a choice and so you could talk to your employer and say this is going on, I'd like to help and you could go. Correct. And in fact employers are encouraged to give their employee reservist time off for a service. And in fact if a reservist does deploy to an operation, the employer can approach the federal government for funding to um, assist in pro getting a backup employee to replace that reservist until he or she returns home. That's fantastic.
we need to support our reserves and our army and everybody together. I understand too that you, you've done some work with the Last Post Fund. Yes, it's a wonderful organization. It's been around for 113 years uh, and its mission uh, is to ensure that uh, no veteran uh, dies uh, without a funeral, burial, and headstone uh, due to lack of funds at time of death. And so the mission of the Last Post Fund is, is to ensure that we honor our veterans uh, in their death and ensure that they have a properly marked grave. However, we also have part of our mission is to look for those who veterans who are in unmarked graves. And there are thousands of them across the country. Uh, we find about a thousand a year, but we cannot afford to put a thousand headstones every year in place. And so we're good for probably about 600. So we're always looking for donation funding to be able to assist in placing headstones uh, on veterans' graves where no headstone exists. I recently found one uh, in the Lumsden Cemetery of a young fellow who served in the Second World War, who after the war was killed in a car accident not far from Lumsden on Highway Number 11 in 1953. And he was buried uh, in a grave that had just a wooden stick that identified um, that he was there. And I know we can do better than that. Yeah. So having researched it, I made application to the last post fund uh, for a proper uh, military headstone. and within a year, or perhaps two at the most, uh, I would expect that when I go back there, I will see, one day, I will see a proper headstone there. How can we donate to that? Mm -hmm. um, the Last Post Fund has a website, uh, www.lastpostfund.ca, and it is possible for you to go there, and there's a donate button that allows you to donate to the Last Post Fund, and you can direct your donation uh, to headstones, if that's what you wish. Well, and thank you for your service in oh, school and the Army. My pleasure. Um, I, I think that it's the right thing to do for Canadians uh, to consider uh, service to their country. Um, and however that works its way out. Uh, and uh, uh, even when you've finished your employment and in retirement, uh, there are ways that you can continue to serve your country. Definitely serves your community. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining us today and thank you for listening. Um, I will make sure to get those email addresses that Randy shared with us on my site so that you can click them. Take care out there. Thank you.